ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಐ ಸಿ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಲೋರ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಐ ಅಡ್ಮಿಟ್ ದಟ್ ಮೈ ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ನಾಟ್ ರಿಸನ್ ಟು ದಿ ಒಕೇಶನ್ ದೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅಬ್ಸರ್ವ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹೈಜೀನ್ ದೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಅನ್ ಹೈಜೀನ್ ದೆನ್ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ದ ಬ್ರಿಟಿಷ್ ಆರ್ ನೋನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ದ ಫ್ರೆಂಚ್ ಆರ್ ನೋನ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಲವರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ಟ್ ದೆ ಕೆನ್ ಗಿವ್ ದ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ಸ್ ದ ರಷ್ಯನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಜರ್ಮನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ರೈಟ್ಲಿ ಆರ್ ರಾಂಗ್ಲಿ ವಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಗಾರ್ಡಿಯಸ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಹೂ ಡೋನ್ ಕೇರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಹೈಜೀನ್ and we are now paying the price for it but the responsibility for making people who are not responsible vest with the authorities it is they who must change the moment from apathy to action you just heard gopal krishna gandhi recounting mk gandhi's words from his south africa years in his conversation with scholar and author sunil khilnani This conversation was based on the latest book Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi Restless as Mercury My Life as a Young Man edited by Gopal Krishna Gandhi which seeks to complement the story of my experiments with truth This episode is an extract from an earlier BIC streams session the full video of which is available on the BIC YouTube channel over to Sunil Thank you very much Lekha for the introduction and thank you to the Bangalore International Center for hosting this event um even in these difficult circumstances that we're all facing across the country at the moment above all thank you to Gopal Gandhi for this really extraordinary book it's an extraordinary book in many ways and i hope we'll all come to some of those ways in the course of the conversation above all it's a daring experiment of a book which seems so appropriate uh, because it's about a man who lived his life as a daring experiment every moment of his life was a daring experiment gandhi is so much about voice uh, his own distinctive voice and yet of course he's constantly voiced over he's constantly dubbed into the ideological languages of other people's preferences uh he's constantly used to t- express the desires of other people to paper over their own fears and ugly secrets and so there's something of a revelation in this book to discover gandhi as a young man uncertain fearful and fierce in his determination to master his fear searching to find his own voice and and i think that's that's something that is is runs through so strongly in this book to his 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 search for through innumerable conversations through innumerable interlocutions to arrive at what would then be what he would call then is his own inner voice and across this book we see this 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 the, the variety of voices uh both that gandhi is engaging with but also that he is in a sense trying out for himself as he seeks to discover his own distinctive voice and i hope we get to some of these points in the course of the conversation but i'd like to begin this evening with a moment in your book which seems as if a mirror to our own grave present moment and that's a moment in early 1904 when gandhi had was newly arrived in johannesburg uh, at that time the sort of hustling gold rush city of southern africa and he was living in the indian neighborhood the indian quarter uh, in fact the indian ghetto in some ways of the city and was very struck by the appalling conditions there the the, the insanitary conditions um and was actually he 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 sort of taking this up with the authorities writing to them uh pointing out the dangers of this the 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 possibility that um disease and indeed an epidemic might hit the city if something were not done and there's something very resonant with how gandhi faced that situation and our own current situation 
And and I, I just want to, well, there's one sentence, I think, which which was really jumped out at me. And I, I just wanted to come to that and then to ask Gopal to talk a bit more about this moment. The, indeed, a plague did break out in Johannesburg about a, a month or so after Gandhi had warned about that possibility. And Gandhi became you know, very involved in setting up medical support for the the. Uh, people who were affected, uh, miners and others. And he he writes about this. And there's one sentence where, where he, and he talks about the delay in action on the part of authorities. And he says that a couple of sentences, which I just uh, was very struck by. He says, at last plague was declared. It required the ocular demonstration of poor men dying like flies for the town council to rise up to the scratch. Gopal, could you take us back to that moment and to what it might mean to us recalling it here and now in India. Thank you very much, Sunil, for uh, citing our discussion in the crisis in which we find ourselves today, a crisis which was unimaginable uh, a year and a half ago. But it was also coming in a way. So there were people, experts in the field of the environment, in the field of diseases with zoonotic origins, who had sounded warnings. We have people uh, in India uh, who can document this, uh, Dr. Srinath Reddy among them. There was something very much uh, of Ibsen's play, The Public Enemy, in which protagonist tells the city there is something grossly wrong with our waterworks. Watch out. And he is not only ignored but derided. So this was coming. And you're absolutely right in noticing Gandhi's alertness to what was happening in terms of utter lack of awareness and a greater lack of responsibility on the part of his own people, the Indian community. And simultaneously, a kind of apathy on the part of the authorities. He says, and I don't want to take too long over it, but it's essential to give us the word pictures which he gives us. He says that a colleague of his, Madanla Gavari, had come to canvas subscriptions for their paper, Indian Opinion, which had been started by Madanji and by Gandhi himself. And one day, Gandhi in Johannesburg got a little note from Madanji saying, come at once. Plague has broken out in this quarter. So he rode in a bicycle to that place and saw in the evening workers would come back from the mines completely broken by this disease. And today, and it's unimaginable, we are in 2021 in the National Capital Territory of India and in other cities. The hospital bed has become so completely unavailable. The, the, we have known of many, many shortages, but the hospital bed shortage is something just absolutely unimaginable. And Gandhi and Madanji broke the lock of an unoccupied house. Now one can ask whether well, this was a nonviolent thing to do, but one will not ask this. So for the moment overrode everything else. The moment was important broke the lock of an unoccupied house and put all these people in and told the authorities that we have done so. And until the patients were able to be shifted to another place, an official hospital situation, they were there. Now, jumping from the physicality of this, which Gandhi with his colleagues in his office tended to the patients, saw them almost to the verge of death, 23 of them at one point, he says in correspondence to newspapers that I admit that my countrymen have not risen to the occasion. They have not observed the laws of hygiene. They have been unhygienic. And then he says, the British are known for certain characteristics. The French are known to be lovers of art, and then he gives the characteristics of the Russians and the Germans. And he says, rightly or wrongly, we Indians 
I regard as people who don't care for hygiene, and we are now paying the price for it. But, and this is what is crucial and the crux, and I'll conclude with this. It says, but the responsibility for making people who are not responsible vests with the authorities. It is they who must change the moment from apathy to action. So he did not exonerate those who suffered because of their own negligence. But he did not allow the authorities to escape the responsibility. And in fact said theirs is the primary responsibility to avert and then to address. I'm so glad you, you picked up on the uh, or emphasized this point about responsibility because it seems to me that in very strong element in this book that you have given us is Gandhi coming to see the importance of and the methods through which power can be held accountable. And in his engagements with smuts in South Africa, with the British in London, this sense of that people have not just a, a right, but a duty to hold power accountable. That it's our responsibility to, in a sense, in a sense, protect each other by holding power accountable. And I wonder, I'd be very interested to, to hear you say a bit more about what are the steps in this move that Gandhi makes to seeing the need to hold power accountable, to make it responsible for its actions, and the ways in which he devises methods to do that, even when he himself has not much power. He is powerless in many ways, and yet he's constantly looking for ways to hold the powerful accountable. Absolutely right. So uh, tellingly put, Neil, he, as you said, had no power. Uh, in fact, he was so conscious of the fact that he had no power uh, that he excavated reserves and seams of power within his powerlessness. First, by saying in the court where he was asked to doff his turban, that I will not do so because this is my identity. I am not here as a servant of the court. I'm not here to press for uh, one or the other parties in the case. I'm just here as an observer and I happen to be in it. This is my identity. My identity is my power. And from that point onwards, drawing on his extraordinary debt to Dada Bhai Nauroji, whose life incidentally has only very recently appeared in the form of Binyar Patel's brilliant biography of Dada Bhai. Dada Bhai Nauroji's example in Britain, the man who started with very, very poor resources, rose to become not only a spokesman for the Indians in, South, in, in Britain, but to, to get elected to the House of Commons, the first, so to say, man of color in that position. Drawing from Nauroji's example, and learning from it, but trying to apply it to the South African situation without ambition and ego of a personal kind, but of a highly representational kind, representing the cause of the Indians, the rights of the Indians, the identity issues of the Indians, as something which should be turned from powerlessness to articulation and from articulation to control, to control over their own destinies. He has said repeatedly that I am not asking for the vote. It's, it's curious. He's saying, I'm not asking for the vote. I'm not asking for us to be represented in, in the elected legislatures, such as they are in South Africa at the time. All I'm asking is that we should have our civic rights in the same way as any subject of the British monarch would have in Britain or elsewhere. He started by telling his own people, that they are neglecting their prerogative, that they are not realizing what they should realize and ask for as their very basic right. And they saw this very fundamental truth and said, we are bad at organization. If you stay on here and organize us, we will, we will do what you think we should do 
to gain our self-respect. And that is then exactly what he did. He used three major instruments. One was the printing press, which he started. But along with that, the printed word in newspapers in South Africa, Durban, Johannesburg, and Cape Town. Incessant writing of notes, articles, letters to the editor of these newspapers. And establishing with great difficulty, but with equal success, an equation with the authorities at every level, the local police commissioner, the local attorney, who then goes on to become prime minister, ministers, smuts himself, but above all, above all, with persons who were creating opinion like the writers, scholars, Olive Schreiner, the poet, Joseph Doak, the missionary, and not so well known, John Dube, the great African who was to become one of the founders of the African National Congress. They did not become close friends. One should know this. They were not colleagues. But Gandhi reached out to Dubey and Dubey to Gandhi on this subject of you, you have described so appropriately as the identification of responsibility and accountability. So much in, in what you've just said, and I'd like to just pick up on a, on a couple of the points and in a sense reiterate them. I mean, I think you know, today we as a, a nation are so over-invested in elections as being the one mechanism of accountability and responsibility. Basically, you know, we have periodically the option of getting rid of the old buggers, as it were. But What's so striking in, in Gandhi is actually his, as, as you said, his, not, not only did he not have access to the vote and couldn't vote for elections, but he, it's not his primary interest. He doesn't actually think that's necessarily the only way that you can challenge power or hold power accountability. But it is through this creation of these other forms, this invention of new types of power. And that's something that I think reading him today at a moment when you know, many people in our country and across the world feel powerless, feel even within the electoral process in some sense disenfranchised. At such a moment to read the, 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 the work of a young man dealing with his own fears, aware of his own powerlessness, and yet constantly looking to invent forms which will give him and his people power to challenge those in power. I think that that's something that is incredibly um, resonant in reading him. And as you say, he focuses on organization. He focuses on the word, on speech, the ability to speak, to write, to talk, to communicate with one another is, and to communicate freely with one another, is a crucial source of power. Authoritarian regimes prefer silence. They don't want to be answerable. They don't Authoritarian leaders don't want to go to parliament. They don't want to have question time because that's where you have to be answerable. But it's precisely by forcing power into dialogue that you can start to hold them accountable, I think. It is striking that, you know, when he is doing this in the early 20th century, across the world, there are other movements also emerging to challenge power, but they are taking the road of violence. So whether it's Lenin in Tsarist Russia or in other parts of the world, the only resort of the powerless seems to be, for many, the option of violence. And what, we, what, what in a sense, one sees in the book, as you sh show us, are the lineaments of this attempt to create a new form of power, uh, which he develops in South Africa, and then, in a sense, brings to the whole world in what he then comes to do in India. And again, there's so much of, of that project which one can't but speak to us today at, at a moment like ours. He took the path of negotiation as the preferred path to get dialogue going because he believed in conversation. Again, something which I think he had derived from his time in Britain. But when he found that his interlocutor was not attentive, was not responsive, was not sympathetic. He said that I will now have to do something on my own, which was organization and agitation. But he never closed the doors to dialogue. During and in fact in real time, as the shuttle flew over the loom, 
as action proceeded on the ground. He kept a channel of conversation going very literally, Sunil, exemplified by the phone call he makes from the, from the field to Smuts to say, now I am calling and Smuts puts the phone down. And then he says, right, then I go back to agitation. So he was discovering procedures for negotiation and agitation without closing the door to either, keeping both going, and with two other very major facets, which these unrecognized parts of his writing show us. One was his mastery of what violence means. He was not a votary of nonviolence from an ignorance or an abjuring of the knowledge of violence. He knew exactly what violence on the field meant by his participation, first in the Second Boer War and then in the Zulu Rebellion. He and his chosen Indian colleagues were under what Pyarelal has described in his book as leaden rain. They were actually under shells and they knew that they could have been knocked out and killed any moment. So Gandhi had entered those two proceedings knowing that he could well have been killed. And it is a miracle that he wasn't and that some of his colleagues were. So he knew what violence meant. He also had a second very major facet to his procedures. Uh, and this came from a conversation with a little known man in London just before he left for India, Pincut. Pincut was an authority on law and he knew Indian students in London. And Gandhi calls him and Pinkat tells him, Gandhi, don't try to be Feroz Shah Mehta in India. Don't try to be a top-ranking lawyer. Don't try to win cases and become famous. If you know the facts of the case, you are sure to succeed. Know the facts of any situation before you try to grapple with it. So knowing facts, mastering details was his tremendous achievement in South Africa. And he was a student, not only of his teachers of Latin and law in Britain, to use a current phrase to me, he was a student of the subaltern satyagrahi in South Africa. The concept of nonviolent, non-resistance, passive resistance, civil disobedience, you are right, was his creation. But the personalities who actuated this were their own creation. When he saw these people in South Africa who gave shape and body to his struggle, he became their student. So when he talks about Tambi Naidu, the Tamil from Mauritius, of Balliamma who died, Nagappan who died, he talks of them like a student would of a leader, a disciple would of a teacher. So he learned facts and procedures from people who were not Dadabhai Nauruji and but from people who were, many of them, totally illiterate and powerless in the complete sense of the term, but full of what can be called passionate intensity. Yes, I think that's one of the beautiful things in your book. We, we often think of, you know, Gandhi as the reader of Tolstoy, the reader of Carlyle, of Ruskin, uh, you know, taking and the mentor of Gokhale and, and Naruj, as you say, taking these ideas from the Kirtar and giants of European and Indian politics and intellectual life. But one of the wonderful things I think this book shows is, is, is how he was, as you say, learning from the exemplary actions of people who were just stepping up to the occasion, people who were not, who didn't have, as you say, the literate background, but who, who had some kind of courage, commitment to their causes. And I think this, what one might call, you know, this, this sort of secondary tier of figures and secondary, not in the sense of their importance, but, but just in terms of how, how we have seen them historically, whom he was learning from and taking courage from and taking inspiration from. I think that, that's, a, that's a really wonderful thing that the book brings to us. I just wanted to come back to, in a sense, his 
the tangibility of violence for Gandhi. As you say, he experienced wars, but he was even he had an even more intimate experience of violence in the sense that he was physically beaten so many times, almost lynched to death uh, in South Africa, beaten on the train uh, on another occasion, beaten by batons on another occasion. He, he had experienced great violence, almost to the point of death. And, and he had also spoken with, at length with advocates of violence. And I wondered, you, 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 have, you talk about his visit to London in, in 1909, his meeting there with Krishna Varma and others, but you, you don't mention his dialogues there with Savarka. And I wondered whether that was a choice or, or because in a sense, so much of, I think, Hind Swaraj is, emerges out of his kind of reflections on and horror at what he felt smart and brave young man like Savarka was advocating. That's a very acute observation, Sunil. Yeah. You're right. Savarkar is almost an incidental player in, in this compilation. I think there was no particular thought behind this, except to say that Savarkar and Gandhi met rather fleetingly in London. And while Gandhi has described that meeting and Savarkar's uh, conversations with him, it was with uh, Shamji Krishnavarma that he had more prolonged discussions. But what emerges is Gandhi saying that he wanted to attend physically the court proceedings in London, in which Madanlal Dhingra was being tried. He said they were not allowed to attend, but he wanted to attend. And he was there during, he reached two or three days after the assassination of the cousin by Lee Dhingra. That had changed everything in London. And he says, but unmistakably, that Dhingra had been guided into what he did, guided into what Gandhi calls an intoxication with violence. And so it is very clear who he is pointing at. And it's also very amazingly, how should I put it, almost foreseeing what was to happen in Delhi three decades later. Somebody inspiring somebody else. And Gandhi talks about this in Hind Swaraj. And Apart from everything else that Hind Swaraj, the book he wrote on his journey back from that visit to London that you mentioned, apart from everything else that, is, that has got a lot of attention, it is his discussion of the, of the folly, not just the futility, but the folly of violence that is most important. And that emerged from his conversations with those whom he calls anarchists and who are later going to be described as the violent school. And this gun of the assassin was smoking in London when Gandhi was there in 1909. And he carried that experience into Hind Swaraj very powerfully. You can feel the scorching of the page of Hind Swaraj by violence. And come back to the very crucial point that you raised about how those who have the chance to use the democratic path and who have sometimes even been propelled into positions of power through the democratic path for feet their claim by their encouragement of hatred, suspicion, and violence that emerges from these pages. Much of what Gandhi has said lies between his words and between his lines, not because he sought to occlude, but because he left the reader to fill in the blanks. Perhaps a literary form of non-violence. With Gandhi, it's always very difficult to separate sort of the public and the private. But I, I did for a moment just want to um, get us to talk a bit about the sort of dimension of the family in these years of Gandhi's life, because it's something that's um, so much there in the, the book, as you've put it together, the context of, of family, family relations, the extended family, and indeed the way in which, in some sense, Gandhi invents family for himself. He creates a kind of new type of family, the ashram, in some sense, being a kind of uh, extended clan that he builds for himself. And, and I was very stuck. I mean, I, I had all, you know, I've always thought that Gandhi valued domesticity very much. He likes the rhythms of domestic life, but he's not that interested in, in his own family as such, um, or as rather could often be quite neglectful of his own family. But, but reading your book, 
one sees an enormous amount of tenderness and care towards members of his family, but also members, people whom he comes to consider as family, that he has this um, sense of, indeed, of responsibility towards them, even as he often can be harsh and worse towards them. And I wondered if you might just say a little bit about how you've come to understand Gandhi's connection with family. It's a valuable question. The impression that Gandhi was neglectful of his family is, I may say with respect, a misimpression. I say this not because I want it to be a misimpression, but simply is the family was very strongly present in his life throughout his life. There was a kind of seamless association of domestic issues, problems, agonies, and public work. His home was a site of his public work, and his public work pulled his family into it at the same time. And so there was a kind of integral, organic connection between the family and his uh, activities in the larger field, exemplified particularly by his eldest son, Harila. And this is something which I was very keen to read myself and then to share with readers. He describes Harila's role in this struggle in South Africa in the most glowing terms, in terms which he has not really used for too many people later on in life. And there is no suggestion that because he is my son, he should not be projected. On the contrary, he says, because he is my son and I can't do everything. In fact, I can't break the law of illegal hawking because I'm a registered attorney and a servant of the court. But Harilal has no such problems. So he will do it. And when he does it, it is like my doing it. And then he says in this extraordinary sentence to use the phrase of yours, sentence which jumps out on you. He says, I would like every Indian to do what Harilal has done. And, uh, and it's, it's a matter of just curiosity. But Harila spent much more time in prison in South Africa in the Satyagra struggle than his father did. Much more, almost twice as much. So this is how it was. And Harila was followed by his younger brother, Marila, who was followed by his next younger brother, Ramdas, and of course, most significantly, by Kasturba. And Kasturba placed the family at the heart of the struggle when she told him on the subject of the non-recognition of marriages outside the uh, civil laws of South Africa, of Cape Town, and outside the Christian rights. Kasturba said, so if, if our marriage is not legal, then our children are not our legal children. So he says, yes, that is right. So that means let's go back to India. So she says, no, we have not come here to go back to India, but to resist such wrong. Then she says, okay, then I will resist it. I want to go in Satyagraha. And she, in a way, forces him to let her go. And then she goes to marriage Bhatia and is given hard labor. Now, hard labor in South Africa in those times and later meant hard labor. And she and the other women, including Valliyama, the great Tamil martyr, they given laundry work, which meant washing the clothes of fellow prisoners. So family and struggle in South Africa, as emerges from these places, were inextricably mixed together. One is, it sort of picks up on, on, on your last point about the marriage laws, and it's really this sense that Gandhi had in South Africa of, of equal treatment for all, at least for the Indians in South Africa. And this sense is mobilization against the past laws, against this business of the, re the need to register and fingerprint Indians and, and, and so forth. The, the, this attempt to create a kind of second-class citizenship in South Africa. And again, something that of course, resonates with our present moment. Gandhi, um, you know, he cites very positively as a counter to the English and South African conception, the, the, the French Republican idea of universal citizenship. That, you know, the French know that all members of the polity are equal. Um, that's kind of built into their political vision in a way that, you know, Imperial Britain was not following. And so it'd be interesting to, to just have your thoughts on that. And then kind of alongside that, you know, this other 
awkward dimension of Gandhi's thought, which, which, which you deal with, Gandhi's practice, which you deal with in the book, which is that he was focused on the Indians in South Africa. And while he had connections with some African intellectuals and had certainly praise and admiration for men like Dubé, he didn't take up the cause of the Africans. Uh, and indeed, he often had comments which, when we hear them with our ears today, are offensive, frankly. And I, I just wondered if you might say something about those two aspects. Yes, they're connected, they're vitally connected. He was the literally and metaphorically the advocate for Indian causes in, in South Africa. That was his uh, self-definition, just as beaver and farmer was his self-definition in India. Advocate, attorney of law, and Satyavi was his self-definition in South Africa for the Indian cause. Some of the descriptions that he gives of the African population are jarring, to put it mildly. They are offensive. And anybody who reading, reading them now would say that these are racist. But are they? Are they really? Racism is something which has to come from belief. There is no question of his having had anything like racism in his belief systems. But he has used those phrases and there's no getting away from them. And which is why I have described those phrases as I have, apart from, of course, showing them exactly as they are. Those words, expressions and descriptions were standard at the time. And Mandela has said, nobody less than Mandela, that we have to judge Gandhi by the vocabulary and the customs of that time. True, we have to. And that, in a way, explains it. But it sort of explains it away. A person with Gandhi's foresight, a person with his laser-like laser foresight and moral intelligence, could have, I think, gone beyond the trappings of contemporary phraseology. But he has not. So let us grant that this is something which jars. Gandhi was always, particularly so as a young man, fallible, evolving, very, very keen. But he has not always self-correct. In this matter, the self-correction was to come much later. And it is important for us today to note that in India, from the period 1914 to 1948, you can see very clear very clear self-corrections on the subject of the African presence in, in South Africa, especially in his conversations with Yusuf Dadu, the great Indian leader who comes and sees him in Bihar during the Bihar college. He's very keen to know what is going to happen. And then he says, as many words, that there's a much larger cause, a much larger cause. So he is, in a sense, conceding the fact that his microscope and his telescope did not catch the large terrain on which he stood, focusing with blinding sharpness on the immediate issues before him. Immediacy, Sunil, is the spirit of his life. He is the product, the player, and in many ways, the creator of immediacies. Restless in the immediate, passionate to change the immediate, obsessively so, and very often, the neglect so much beyond that disk of vision. It's so telling that you use the word immediacy in this context because, of course, that also describes the book itself. It has the immediacy of his own words. And, you know, as, as you say in, in the early in the book, it's this immediacy which really is Gandhi's organic truth. That's, it's not the later layers of varnish uh, it's not the later accounts, but it's Gandhi in the moment as he's you know, figuring out where to put his next step in the realization that it may be a misstep. That's really what, what is the kind of power of seeing this life being lived. It's, it's not the retrospective sort of pedestalization and celebration of the life, however effective that may be, but it's actually the riskiness of living the life as he lived it, uh, which I think is, is, is the great power of that life. And the riskiness of, of, in a sense, an ordinary person. I think that's also something that, you know, one of Gandhi's favorite book was The Pilgrim's Progress and this sense of a kind of ordinary life that had to be, 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 be lived. And the way in which he acknowledges his own fear, his own trembling, his, you know, great 
fear at speaking in public, etc. And that's immediacy, as you put it, is is so powerful in this book. And I, I wonder, I mean, j- just coming from that, the book itself, it's, it, as I said at the beginning, it's a daring experiment. You know, you have kind of taken on the task of writing Gandhi's autobiography for him. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you sort of conceived of that risk and how you actually put it together, how you made the choices you did. What what were the kind of criteria that you were bringing to bear? Sunil, Shotijit Rai once said that every time somebody sees his film, he's making it afresh. That every viewing of Uthar Pansali was making Uthar Pansali afresh. So that is also true of any reading, not just this, any reading. Some things stay with you when you read them. And some things strike you when you read them, which may not stay with or strike somebody else. And with Gandhi's life in his own words, there were episodes which I remembered for no particular reason, and inexplicable why I remembered them more than others. I found them interesting and I found that others also seem to find them interesting. And I found this ocean of material in the collected works for which we have to thank Professor Swaminathan and his associate C.N. Patel for having just put them together, literally an ocean. And every biographer has scuba dive and collected the modes from that, as has happened in this now, compilation and translation, retranslation of some things which he wrote originally in Gujarati was a fascinating task. I'll just give one example. He says about this famous incident of his having been a very scared little child, an idiotically and absurdly scared child, scared of the dark. And he says in Gujarati, he was afraid of, simple Gujarati word, Sarpadi. Now, sarp is snake and adi is etc. You can say snakes and such like. But actually, the image that comes to my mind is that in contemporary English, is he was afraid of creepy crawlies. And so I just had to say in retranslation, as a child, I was afraid of the dark. And of creepy crawlies because sarpadi, and you can you can imagine these slithering creatures. That sarpadi, creepy crawlies, became for him almost a kind of his future fears, but a fear which led him to become unafraid of two things, which can again be traced back to creepy crawlies: unafraid of defeat and unafraid of death. And one can add, unafraid of what can be called unpopularity, unafraid of death, of defeat, and of unpopularity. These three for him held no fear. And that is what in the various segments from his life, which have been included either in the original in the English or in translation or retranslation, just to bring out the inner life of these words. And his Gujarati, if I may just say in conclusion, is a joy to read for those who have read it in Gujarati, like Faisal Devji, for instance. He says that his Gujarati is something else. It truly is. And retranslating his Gujarati in contemporary English has been a great joy, if also not always a successful one. Yeah, no, I think this this rediscovery of Gandhi through new translations is one of the exciting things of these these recent years. And to have also um, uh, Tridup Surad's new translation of the autobiography from Gujarati has also been a revelation in many ways. So I just want to end with, in addition to Gandhi's own words, in the book, you also weave in the words of some of his of contemporaries, uh, indeed his first biographer, Dolk, uh, Millie Pollock, who writes about him, Ch- uh, Chaganlal Gandhi, his nephew, and other contemporaries. We don't have the voices of contemporaries who didn't admire him or who had kind of looked at him more askance or with a more squint in, in their eye. Was that now, you know, that may not have been possible to fit in to a book of this kind, but, but was that when you were working on it, 
uh, were you also struck by the the opposition uh, and and critical and angry voices that he faced? Since this was a compilation of uh, his autobiographical observations, it was logical that autobiographical observations uh, which he had shared with his contemporaries and which they had put into books which were published in his lifetime, except for Parilla, became almost part of his extended autobiography. Mm. To include observations of a critical or of a appreciative nature from other books about him may not have fitted into the autobiographical narrative, though they would have been uh, very logical to include in a study of Gandhi. But I was very conscious of the need to put in self-criticism by Gandhi from his autobiographical writings, including self-criticism and including writings, which are not self-critical at all, but which would make any reader feel extremely critical of him. This would include his descriptions of his wife, Kasturba, in frank conversations and writings to Kalimba. Now, this is something which he has written. This is in the public domain. It's in the collected works. It is quite shocking. And anybody who reads it would say, how can a man speak like this of his own life? But then it is part of history. And hurtful as it might be to him, I thought it should be in the book. Also because there is so much of utter and the most extraordinary love and admiration of his wife, which he also has put in. And so we have to have both. We have both his tributes to his wife, which come like almost like an admirer and a student of his wife. And then this excoriation, which is frank difficult to read. You know, one of the powerful things that comes across in reading the book is, as you say, you know, Gandhi may be endlessly co-optable into other projects. And in fact, that's there's a whole industry of co-optation, uh, political uh, and other, even commercial. Remember, at one point, he was used to sell Mont Blanc pens. So, you know, he's out there. But there's also a way, and this picks up on the wonderful title of your book, in which he is unendingly mercurial, and which is to say that he is constantly splitting and escaping our urges to make, to contain him in one crucible or in one uh, box or in one particular space. Um, and even as he is constantly escaping, Mercury, of course, always holds its own its own attributes. It's very hard to assimilate it in and di dilute it into other uh, elements. And, and, and there's a way in which I think Gandhi has this capacity of his words and his actions uh, spreading through a society, spreading through history in this proliferating way with very, very unexpected outcomes, as, is, as has happened in South Africa, in America, in so many other parts of the world. And, as one has to hope, will happen again in India. So thank you very much, Gopal, for, this, this, for bringing his voice back to us in such a direct and immediate way. No, no, I must just add uh, my own word of thanks uh, to the uh, Agile International Centre. Uh, for having uh, hosted this conversation, and uh, Sunil, to you for uh, for the for the gift of sharp reading, so rare today, sharp, focused, not uncritical, but such intense reading, deeply analytical, and so true in the ring. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there and listening to the full conversation. If you liked what you heard, do share it with friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew behind this podcast is God of Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saranaraj and Rahu Tenkaila. Episode artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu, signing off on behalf of everyone at PIC.